Well, good evening. Good evening. You know, I have to say that I'm a little intimidated by um, talking about the second half of Mount Olive's history. Because the, for the first half, you know, that was mostly 100, 150 years ago. So if I didn't get it exactly right, no one here would really know the difference, <laughs> except for Ken. And it's not that he's that old, but he just knows things. Um, but, so, but for tonight, all of us here have lived at least some part of the last 75 years, some of them more than others, and, um, and you all have your own stories and histories and interests. Um, so here's my disclaimer, right? I'm not a historian, I love history, and I love stories. Ken, of course, Ken Dilda is the brains behind this partnership. He is a retired history professor at the University of Mount Olive. He's the driving force behind the Mount Olive Area Historical Association and director of the John, David John Aaron Teaching and History Museum. And I think he's wonderful. Um, so without him, I wouldn't be here tonight, that's for sure. But that said, my goals are the same as the last time that I stood before you, is to give you the broad outlines of Mount Olive's story, to tell you at least one thing that you didn't know before about your hometown, and that you just can't wait to go home and tell somebody about it, and to appreciate more of what you see every day, to see Mount Olive with new eyes. Now, So, George Melvin Carr, he was a newspaper reporter from Wilmington, and he wrote about his visit to Mount Olive way back in 1883. And I believe his observation about Mount Olive is still true today. The inhabitants are not only enlightened and clever, but are also widely known for their generosity and kindness. And tonight's talk is really more about the people of Mount Olive, maybe more so than the buildings. For those who left and made their mark on the world, Mount Olive never really left them. And then there are those who came here or were born here and they stayed. Many spent their lives quietly working to make Mount Olive a better place and its people stronger. And tonight, I'm only going to talk about a precious few because, well, we only have an hour. So, at the first part, we left off um, our stories ended in the late 1930s, and I promised that I would pick back up around the time of World War II, and so I'm doing that today by highlighting two of Mount Olive's most famous sons who, that you may or may not have ever heard of. The first is Marion Hargrove, and the second is Sam Bird. Edward Thomas Marion Lawton Hargrove, Jr. <laughs> also known as Marion, was born in Mount Olive. His father, Marion Sr., was a railway mail clerk, and his mother was Emma Jernigan Harbor. As a boy, Marion recalled playing in a cemetery, and that would be Myrtle Grove, not Maplewood. All right. One day, when he was eight years old, a tombstone fell over on top of him, severely injuring his left leg. At Dr. John Wilkins' orders, he spent the remainder of that summer bedridden while he healed. And at Dr. Wilkins' suggestion, he began reading everything he could get his hands on. He credited that time of his life and Dr. Wilkins with instilling in him a love of the written word that would propel him on to a successful Hollywood career. Hargrave later said, from that time on, I never learned an honest trade and never did an honest day's work. <laughs> The family later moved to Charlotte, and as a young adult, he began an association with the Charlotte Observer. He was drafted into the Army in 1941, and he began writing a series of dispatches for the paper, describing his adventures as a very unlikely soldier in training. Compiled into a book, See Here, Private Hargrove, um, his collection of stories became the number one bestseller in 1942 with over three million copies sold. The movie version appeared in 1944 starring Robert Waller, Walker, Donna Reed, and Robert Benchley. The sequel, What Now, Corporal Hargrove, hit movie screens in 1945. After the war, 
Um, Parker settled into a busy career as a screenwriter. He wrote or co-wrote nine screenplays, including the 1959 film Cash McCall and the popular 1952 musical, the, um, the adaptation, the screen adaptation of the musical The Music Man, which won a Writers Guild Screenplay Award. And he wrote tons of familiar TV shows, The Waltons, Maverick, featuring James Garner, remember those? Um, I Spy, Fantasy Island, Eight is Enough, and a whole list of others. In 1998, um, Marion Hargrove donated all of his original scripts and his papers to Steele Memorial Library. And he came to Mount Olive for the dedication of that ceremony, for the dedication of that May. So you see him here, you know, Hollywood screenwriter, um, chatting away with Huey Lewis, right? Um, and his cousin, that's his cousin, Brownie Sutherland. He still has a lot of family, because if you're akin to a hard, hard road or a Jernigan around here, you have a whole lot of kin. So, um, so that's Marion Hargrove. The next is Sam Burr. Um, he was born in Mount Olive in 1908, and he, um, his father died the year after he was born. So Sam spent his formative years here in Mount Olive, and he also spent a significant amount of time with the Walmer Cherry family. And they lived in what we know today as the Grand Perry Cherry House, which is on West Main Street right next to Mount Olive Presbyterian Church. Um, Sam moved to Sanford, Florida at age 14 when his mother remarried, but in the 1930s, he would often return to Mount Olive and he would visit with the Cherries and he stayed in touch with his hometown. A trip to New York in 1929 launched his Broadway career. His first critical role in 1933 was as Dude Lester in the play Tobacco Road. He played 1,151 performances and he earned the best young actor on Broadway that season. He also produced a number of plays. And then he also wrote Small Town South, which is based on his life in Mount Olive in Sanford, Florida, and it received the Life in America Prize in 1942. Now some will say, and I don't look at anybody in the room, but some will say that some of his stories, well, you know, they maybe kind of stretch the truth a little bit, but you know, that's called literary license. Um, Bird, he had a distinct, the thing about him too, about the, with World War II, is he had a, a distinguished military career in World War II. I mean, he earned the Bronze Star for evacuating casualties from the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. So he was stuck to dance. Um, and he was part of the Battle of Okinawa. He used his Navy experiences later for a novel, Hurry Home to My Heart, which was actually set in Mount Olive and Seven Springs. He died, um, in, he was living in the area when he died in 1955 of leukemia, and he's buried here in Mount Olive. So, that kind of takes us up to the 40s and 50s. Like the rest of the country, Mount Olive in the post-war years prospered. The town grew into its role as a small commercial center serving a broad agricultural area, and the neon lights of Center Street glowed in the evenings. I don't know if you can really tell it from this picture, um, but you can kind of see the neon lights, the signs, which is so typical of the 50s. You see them kind of glowing um, down the streetscape, and I think it's so cool. If you look on the left, you'll see, Mama, here's the belt tilers. Mama still calls it belt tilers, even though it's just belt. The new institutions came into being, and existing ones expanded. The produce brokers from the 1920s and 30s, we had talked about them last time, they were still thriving, but the local economy, once powered by mules and horses, gave way to cars and car dealerships and chain department stores. Um, and I chose this image because the Belks um, was standing in the 100 block of um, Southwest Center Street, and they tore down A. Pickett's um, stables, the, um, the, where they still bought mules. So they tore that staple down to make way for the belt. Well, um, a new and larger belt department store was later built around the corner on West Main Street, 
and that's where you are today. This was originally a belt store, and we converted it to a library, and a fabulous library at that. Center Theater. This was just kind of fun. So, Center Theater was built on the site of a former opera house on 203 North Center Street in October of 1947. It was Mount Olive's first air-conditioned building. Wow. <laughs> so in 1951, admission was 62 cents for afternoon movies, 83 cents for adults, and 30 cents for children. And I'm just thinking, why couldn't they just round it up to 60 or 85? But anyway. So this particular photo is pretty funny. Um, it was uh, Mount Olive's first X-rated movie. The story was about an innocent young girl who became pregnant and delivered a stillborn child. The childbirth was shown. Patrons were segregated by gender. Women and girls could attend the 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock screenings, but the men could only come at 9. It was billed as the world's only educational hygiene show. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, but the best part about it was there was a cod place in the lobby for anybody who fainted during the movie. <laughs> now, the theater closed in 1972, and it had, of course, has been vacant ever since. But it is currently owned by Ron Roberts, owner of the R&R &R Brewing, and he is slowly working to bring the building back into repair. So I'm excited to see what might become of that in the future. So, the Henderson Crumpton Clinic. So, Dr. Henderson came to Mount Olive to start his practice in 1914, and years later, he and a young physician named um, Warren Crumpler teamed up for the Henderson Crumpler Clinic, which opened in 1949. The building, which is still standing at the corner of Center and John Streets, houses other businesses today. And the Olivet Hotel, remember the beautiful hotel that we saw that picture? That was torn down to make way for the clinic. But the Henderson Crumple Clinic delivered 600 babies in its first year. And at one time, more babies were born there than at Wayne Memorial Hospital and among all other Wayne County physicians combined. Dr. Henderson died in 1963, and Dr. Crumpler worked at the clinic until 1971, and it closed for good in 1976. Now, a funny story about Dr. Clinton, Dr. Henderson. Everybody's got a funny story about Dr. Henderson if you knew him. Um, next door to the clinic was a drugstore um, that the pharmacist Jack Lister ran. And uh, of course, Dr. Henderson's house was further down the street where current um, Ficken Insurance now stands. So, and of course, we talk about doctors and their handwriting. Well, Dr. Henderson had gone to the beach once to see about a boat. And he made notes. And when he got back to town later and decided that he you know, wanted to make a decision about his boat, he couldn't read his handwriting. <laughs> so he had to go next door to Jack Lister for Jack to decipher his notes. <laughs> um, the Henderson Crumpler Clinic made um, an impact on at least two other future doctors, Dr. James Royal Lambert, was a young boy um, and was a patient at the clinic growing up and the dapper Dr. Henderson just made an impression on him. And Dr. Kenneth Wilkins, who was the son of Dr. John Wilkins, who had practiced for years in Iowa, um, he also went into medicine, and but he spent time at the clinic um, as a young physician. And the experience there um, led him to seek additional training in obstetrics, and he ran an obstetrics and gynecology practice in Goldsboro for decades. All right, and I'm going to mention another doctor here because it's just so hard to leave people out, but Dr. Lowndes, Dr. Milton Lowndes. When Dr. Henderson arrived in 1914, he set up his practice on the northeast side of Center Street, where Goshen Medical Center's practice now is. And Dr. Lowndes came in behind Dr. Henderson in that building in the 1950s, and then Dr. Lambert followed him. And now, of course, it's Goshen Medical. So that location has been the site of the doctor's office for nearly 110 years. So a quick story about Dr. Lowndes. He came from a family of undertakers. 
And, um, and they tried to persuade him to stay and practice medicine in his hometown. And as he told it, they begged him, stay here with us. We can bury your mistakes. <laughs> I don't know if it's true, but Dr. Lowndes did tell me that. So another daughter that practiced for many years in Nanala <coughs> is Dr. Thomas Rivera. But Dr. Rivera grew up in Puerto Rico and he graduated from the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, Tuskegee. Tuskegee. So, yeah. And he completed his medical degree um, at Meharry Medical School in Nashville, Tennessee. North Carolina had only a handful of medical practices and hospitals in the early 1900s that treated African Americans. That Mount Olive had, a, had Dr. Rivera's clinic was just remarkable. The closest hospital for African Americans in that time was over in Wilson, 40 miles away. That was before most families had cars and nearly a century before I, 795, actually made it easy to get to Wilson. But Dr. Rivera was known for, among other things, for his treatment of asthma, and he treated white and um, black patients. I remember Nelson Bland, the late Mount Olive Tribune reporter, talking about how his parents took him to see Dr. Rivera at his house on South Chestnut, on South Center Street. And his house, by the way, is still standing. But the location of the clinic itself is unknown. But we do know he did treat patients from his house. Dr. Rivera practiced medicine for 48 years. And when he passed away at his home in April 1965, Wayne Memorial Hospital had just recently integrated so that his patients finally could go to their local hospital for care. And in many ways, the burger joints provided the original form of social networking for generations of young people. So in the 1950s, Albert Soderbrill was the place to go if you were a teenager. My dad all talked about being at Albert Soda Grill and how much he always thought of Albert Farah, the owner. Albert's was located on North Center Street next door to the current Debbie's Head hairstyling. Employees back in the day included Elizabeth Tootie Flowers, Tempe Odom, Louie Barwick, and one Bill Bird. If that name sounds familiar, he's the retired University of Mount Olive president. So pictured on the left in the, are two patrons, um, Bill Upchurch Jr. and Jack King. And sitting on the hood of that car, it looks like something straight out of Happy Days, right? Yeah. Well, in 1959, Relma Smith opened his Smitty's Big Tea Drive-In on Brazil Avenue. At first, it was a real drive-in restaurant. I can remember riding with my parents who ordered from a car and our food was brought to us on a platter that hung on the car window. I thought that was the coolest thing. But Smitty's for my generation was the Alberts of my dad's. We hung out there on weekends. If we didn't have a date, we went to Smitty's. If we did have a date, we went to Smitty's. <laughs> if we were going somewhere else, we met and parted at Smitty's. I met my future husband at Smitty's. Oh, and the burgers were absolutely fabulous too. When Smitty's closed in 1992, I cried, along with three decades of young people before me. Smitty's was a rite of passion. But there were other places that I remember. Um, as a little girl, my, my grandmother loved the little men. I hadn't thought about the little men in forever. Um, the original building of the little men is still uh, just sitting there next door to the Piggly Wiggly and is owned by Best Use Cars. And y'all can help me remember, but I think it, it, you just see the building, but it had like an, um, a tucker driveway where you could pull up and park under a shelter and, um, and get your food. And then when Hardy's first came to town in the 1970s, I remember that, man, that was a big deal that Mount Olive had arrived because we got, had a Hardy's. Of course, the original location was on North Brazil Avenue, across from the Big Blue Wiggly, and that's now the Family Dollar. That first Hardy's closed in the 1990s, but it returned to a brand new store on NC55 in 2018. And when it came back, since we have all these other burger joints, I can say that we kind of went, okay. 
Um, but next sort of that Hardee's on 55 is the brand new Highway 55 burger shakes and fries. The franchise is headquartered here in Mount Olive. You all, most of you know the story. It was originally called Andy's Burger Shakes and Fries, named for Kenny Moore's son. But um, Kenny founded the, um, the store in 1991. He played baseball at Mount Olive College and married uh, Mount Olive native Karen Williams, and he found inspiration for his own restaurant from Smitty's. He opened his first location in Goldsboro's Berkeley Mall, and he cooked every burger himself. He couldn't afford to build a separate kitchen, so he cooked over an open grill, which became the hallmark of Highway 55 stores. Because the open grill provided greater interaction with customers. Um, the Highway 55 headquarters moved to Mount Olive in 2003, and today the franchise serves over 135 stores in nine states and several foreign countries. Pretty cool. All right. You know, we can't talk about Mount Olive without talking about Mount Olive College. And in truth, it's probably one of the biggest, one among the biggest impacts that it's had on our community. And I know I see lots of Mount Olive College folks here. First organized as Mount Olive, Mount Allen Junior College by the North Carolina Convention of Free Will Baptist in 1951. It actually started in the mountains at the denominations um, at the Craigmont. Um, but they came to Mount Olive in 1953 so it could be more centrally located to um, the denomination's Eastern North Carolina roots. And at the time it was renamed to Mount Olive Junior College. They, um, the denomination purchased the old Mount Olive Elementary School on the 200 block of North Brazil Avenue. The buildings had already served the community for 40 years. They were already wore out when they bought them. Um, and its first president was a 26-year-old Freewell Baptist minister of Amber, Kid Rainbow. At the time, he was the youngest college president in the country. And he, when he retired 40 years later, he was the longest tenured college president. The school had 22 students its first collegiate year in 1954, and Dr. Raper was frequently quoted as saying that when he arrived, the college had a grand total of $6.17 in its bank account. Local leaders, including Dr. Henderson, lent their support to the um, fledgling college. Its first buildings on its current 100-acre campus, the Henderson Building, and the Women's Residence Hall opened in 1965. Do that. Okay. All right. Okay. Just so I don't have to yell too loud. Um, so, and we know the first four-year baccalaureate degrees were awarded in 1986, and the name changed to the University of Mount Olive in 2014. All right. So, um, Mount Olive is, uh, I think we've, we've I've talked about this a little before early on, but Mount Olive is the home of an Olympian, a World Series winning pitcher, and a two-time Super Bowl winner. All out of little bitty Mount Olive. So, first we're going to talk about the pitcher, Ray Scarborough. He was a major league pitcher from Mount Olive who helped the New York Yankees win the World Series in 1952. He pitched to the major leagues from 1942 to 1953, including stints with the Washington Senators, the um, Chicago White Sox, the Boston Red Sox, and the Yankees before ending his season with the Detroit Tigers. He got around. He married Mount Olive native Edna Martin. And in the off season, he worked as a salesman for Mount Olive Pickles. I can't speak to how many cases of pickles he actually sold, but he was known in the Boston and New York markets as the pickle peddling pitcher. <laughs> and there are cartoons of him dumping opposing players into pickle barrels. Ray supported the construction of the baseball field at the University of Mount Olive, and Scarborough Field is named in his honor. So this picture, by the way, is just so cool. So these are uh, uh, Red Sox teammates. The guy on the end is um, Lou Bedreau. Bedreau. The older fella in the middle is Cy Young. The Cy Young. 
the pitcher, the one that the award is named for. And then next to him is Ted Williams. And the erase carbon is on the, on the end. And apparently they're talking, Cy Young was describing how he would hold the ball to throw a certain pitch. How cool is that? Now this is something that I didn't know until I started getting ready for this. Mount Olive over, the t over time has actually had two airports. The first one in Mount Olive was a broad grassy strip that stretched along Brazil Avenue from about where Bees on Brazil is, you know what I'm talking about? Um, all the way up to where Handy Mart sits at the corner of 55 in Brazil Avenue. Um, and it operated throughout the 1950s, but it closed when Highway 55 was built. So the current Mount Olive um, Municipal Airport was dedicated in September of 1967. It was renamed Yanger Field and dedicated during Mount Olive's Centennial Celebration in 1970. Charles Yeager himself attended the ceremony. He was base commander at Seymour Johnson at the time. Um, and as you know, Yeager, he was considered among the best pilots of all time. He was the first pilot to ever break the sound barrier in 1947, and his Air Force service spanned 30 years and three wars. Oh, that is so cool. Um, and I will go ahead and put in a plug for the airport today. Um, it's a, it's got a runway, uh, it's 5,200 um, feet long, it's long enough to accommodate Porker jets. You can see those flying overhead where they're coming in and landing. They have hangar rentals to house planes and a waiting list for space. They sell jet fuel and they have a first class aircraft maintenance services on site. So, um, and citing a critical shortage of airline pilots nationally that we're all kind of looking at, the university launched a flight school based at the airport within the last few years. So now we kind of want to roll into the 60s and the 70s. Um, and I'll just kind of start with the consolidation that happened in 1965 with, Southern, with the construction of Southern Wayne High School. Um, Carver High School, which served African-American students throughout the county, um, was combined with Mount Olive High School, as well as with students from Grantham, Seven Springs, and Brogdon communities. And everybody was rolled into one big high school at Southern Wayne. So, in like Wayne Memorial, it was one of the many community institutions that began that process of integration in the 1960s. So here's another fella that I really had never heard of until we started all this. And his name is Dr. Coy Webster Waller, and he grew up at Smith's Chapel. He's one of those Smith's Chapel Wallers, all right? Um, he graduated from Mount Olive High School, but he is internationally known for his research in the chemistry of antibiotics and vitamins. And over the years, he received uh, more than 50 patents on his work. He was long associated with the University of Mississippi. Um, he was director of the Research Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Ole Miss, and the Coy Waller Laboratory Complex on the campus is named for him. He was no slow leap, folks. College Plaza. College Plaza was, and you may think, we are talking about shopping centers. Well, College Plaza was the first shopping center that came to Mount Olive, and it was developed by Moses King who um, owned Piggly Wiggly, and, um, and so Piggly Wiggly was the first store in that shopping center when it opened, and he chose the site because of its proximity to Mount to college and to downtown. And within two years, the shopping center featured Max, Family Dollar, and Boyd Drugs, which was run by Bob Boyd, um, who was also a Mount Olive resident. This photo is an ad from um, the news artist in 1976. And then I mean, you can't really make it out, it's too good, but round steak was $1.29 a pound, smoked ham was 79 cents a pound, and barbecue was $1.99 a pound. So, yeah. I don't can just see what that translates when you go to the grocery store. Um, and by the end of the 1970s, the produce markets 
had all closed, although agriculture remained a big part of the local economy. But by then, tobacco, not cotton or produce, was king. So the agriculture and, um, had changed in this area. So the new emphasis for the town was attracting manufacturing. And in this period, several companies came to town, employing hundreds. Burlington Industries had its drapery plant. Young Squire manufactured clothing. And the bowling company made office furniture. We still have office furniture from the bowling company at, in the offices, in some offices at Mount Olive Pickle. Georgia Pacific in Dudley had its plywood plant and Mount Olive Pickle continued its, op its operations as well, and we marked our 50th year of operation in 1976. Now, I don't know what Mr. Walker did to celebrate, but I'm sure he did something. Y'all know him. So Mount Olive Family Medicine. Um, Dr. Shackelford was a, uh, Dr. Robert Shackelford, a Kinston native, opened his practice in Mount Olive in 1949. In 1970, he teamed up with Dr. Herbie B. Kennedy Sr. of Calypso to open Mount Olive Family Medicine on Smith Chapel Road. The building is now the present location of Wayland Animal Clinic. Um, in 1997, the physicians converted their practice to a nonprofit rural health center, helping ensure, helping ensure its long-term viability in the community. So it wouldn't, its success wouldn't just rest on them. In 2002, the brand new facility was built, um, opened on the 200 block of Brazil Avenue. It's the same site, by the way, as of the old Mount Olive Elementary School and the college's first campus. So that old school building was demolished finally, after 80 years, um, to make way for the medical facilities construction. Dr. Shackelford retired from Mount Olive Family Medicine in 2012 with over 60 years of service and he passed away in 2019. Dr. Kennedy worked in the practice until early 2020. Right so um, prior to the late 1950s, there was no rescue squad in Mount Olive. Ambulance services at the time were provided by the local funeral homes in their hearses or occasionally in the back of a local physician's station wagon. One story I remember my grandmother telling me was that in the early 1950s, my dad, who was a teenager, was critically injured in a car accident. And the hearse driver delivered my dad to Wayne Memorial. My dad actually wasn't expected to make it that night. So the driver sat all night in the hallway next to my grandparents, waiting to see if my dad lived or died. He didn't want to go all the way back to Mount Olive and then have to turn around and go back to Goldsboro for the flight. Seriously. My grandmother did not find his presence very comforting. No. <laughs> um, I can see, she's just I'm sitting there crying and I'd, I'd look up and there he'd sit and I'd start crying all over again. Um, but my dad obviously survived, and uh, as I'm here today to tell the tale. So clearly the community was in desperate need of a trained medical ambulance service. So the volunteer medical, the volunteer Mount Olive Rescue Squad was organized as part of the town's civil defense agency in 1958 through the efforts of James Hatcher. The first vehicle was a surplus World War II Jeep with a canvas top. And the Mount Olive Chamber led a fundraising drive for the first recovery vehicle. This photo was taken in the early 1960s, so they had obviously accumulated a number of vehicles and equipment by then. And this photo was actually taken um, from at Mount Olive College from the maybe an upper floor window facing James Street. Because I, I can you can see James Street coming down the side, which I just thought was cool. So which kind of takes us to the 80s and 90s. The town separated the rescue squad from the Civil Defense Agency in 1964, and the rescue building on North Center Street was constructed in 75. But beginning in 1979 and continuing through the 1990s, the Mount Olive Rescue Service won several state competitions and competed in national and even international contests. It was widely recognized as one of the best rescue squads in the state. Long-term captains who served in the squad's volunteer years include Ray Brogdon, 
Kenneth Fawkes, Gary Kelly, Brad King, Dennis Lane, Guy McKee Jr., y'all heard any of these being familiar names? Ben Sellers, Ray Thompson, and Charles Swenson. Charlie actually served as commander and vice commander of the North Carolina Association of Rescue and EMS um, for a time. Wayne County moved to a full, a paid full-time EMS system in 2003. The town still owns the rescue building and the fire department stores equipment there now. We think, Michael and I were looking, my husband, we were looking at these pictures and some of these folks are about our age. So they had to be at least 18 to serve on the rescue squad. So we figure early 1980s. But it's fun to look, I didn't recognize Ray Brogdon on the front row there on the far end. I'm used to looking for his white, snowy white head. So also in the 1980s, we had the, um, the launch of the North Carolina Pickle Festival. I wonder if he knows anything about that. <laughs> so, uh, um, in the years prior to that, there had been a festival of flowers that um, the community put on. And I think we actually, if I can remember, I wasn't here then, um, but uh, we had, I think the town has some consultants come in and kind of help from the Carolina Power and Light and kind of talk about the town's assets. And so um, the first North Carolina Pickle Festival was held in 1986. And at the time, it was a joint effort between Mount Olive and Basin. And Mount Olive Pickle and um, Kate's, it was Kate's Pickles at the time. And so we would do a Friday night on Friday night events in Faison, downtown Faison, downtown Faison, and um, and then we did the festival down here all day on Saturday. And when I first came back home in the early 90s, 1993, I can remember loading up my kids and we went down to Faison, and they thought it was great because they could just run wild out because it was all fenced in, and I didn't have to worry about them getting anywhere. Um, so that's how we got our start. And over the years, um, the Kate's Pickle facility changed hands over time, and so they weren't as engaged. So it just became focused here on, in, on Mount Olive, but we still had the Friday night stuff. I mean, that's still a, a, um, just sort of a, a callback to our beginnings, which I think is pretty cool. So we, are, we just completed our 36th year um, Julie has been doing this for 30, she's close to 30 years. Close to 30. Um, and, uh, and we've won tons of awards over the years. We've, we've, we've tried to make sure we get at least one award at the North Carolina Association of um, Festivals and Events in January. And pretty much every year we've won at least something. So it's a ton of fun. Y'all like that. <laughs> So, Henrietta Highsmith Williams. She spent her entire life clothing and feeding the community's poor and creating opportunities for young children and taking care of old folks. And she's standing in front of the senior center that she helped establish. She was one of the first three statewide recipients of the Nancy Susan Reynolds Humanitarian Award when it was awarded in 1986. How cool is that? Um, she actually died in 2004 at the age of 107. Stephanie Kennedy. I knew Stephanie was a really good golfer, and yeah, but I didn't really know as much about I learned about Stephanie. So, to me, the best storyline is at 12 years old, Stephanie was named by Golf Digest as the youngest club champion in the world. She won Southern Lane Country Club's club championship at 12. So, she beat all those men who play golf. And, you know, which I think was just hilarious. Um, so, uh, she was also the first. Um, girl to play on a boys school golf team in North Carolina. She was the first woman to earn a golf scholarship at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
And while she was at UNC, she also played basketball um, for the UNC women's team. She played forward. One of you know, these wonderfully athletically talented folks. She won a number of amateur tournaments. She was the only junior girl to win all three state titles in North and South Carolina. She entered the ladies' professional golf tour um, in 1983, and she competed until a wrist injury ended her pro career in 1985. The Olympian. Remember, we had a World Series, and we had an Olympian. And the Olympian is Leora Sam Jones. She graduated from Southern Wayne High School in 1978. Um, she competed in team handball competition in the 1984, 88, and 92 Olympics. In each of those years, Sam was named the National Player of the Year in handball. She played professionally for Austria and Germany in the 1980s, and she served as the assistant coach for the U.S. national handball team in 1993 to 1995. She also was a standout basketball player at East Carolina, and it was there that she was actually first introduced to playing handball and realized that she really liked it, and clearly she was really good at it. In 1988, the Olympian magazine called her one of the best women to ever play team handball in the United States. And she's back home. And we, I've run into her a couple of times, which is really cool. Yeah. No small potatoes, folks. Okay, so we get to 1999. It is the um, the eve of the new millennium, and I had just gone to work at Mount Olive Pickle Company and was learning pickle PR from the feet of the master, John Neal Walker, who was president emeritus at the time. Um, he thought he was he made sure that Mount Olive pickles were registered as an, the official pickle and pepper of the millennium. Did you not? <laughs> he did. You know, you don't you remember, remember all those millennial yeah. millennium project, you know, products? Well, we were the official pickle and pepper. <laughs> so New Year's Eve was coming up, and he thought, you know, why don't we do something with this? You know, why don't we drop a pickle on the new year? And I said, Sure. <laughs> so uh, the pickle that he and John and he and Margaret are holding, we actually borrowed from the airport, from the display at the airport, because the gift shop was already closed and I couldn't get a full pickle out of the gift shop at the time. And that one just happened to have home of Mount Olive Pickles on the table. So we had, uh, there were eight of us. So Johnny and Margaret, um, our maintenance superintendent who had the pickle on the road, my husband and my children, my two children, and then the guy in the pickle suit who had a date that night for his New Year's. <laughs> so we did it at 7 o'clock because it was just as dark at 7 o'clock as it would be at midnight, and we took our pictures, and there's some of them. <laughs> <laughs> So that was the very first New Year's Eve pickle drop um, in Mount Olive. How does date turn out? <laughs> he, I don't think, he didn't marry the girl, I don't think, oh. that he just went on a date with. Because he didn't get married to a while later. So, uh, so yeah, there's the pictures. And as y'all know, uh, we actually had our 20th New Year's Eve pickle drop in 2019. Yes, going into 2020, and then of course the world turned upside down with COVID. Um, we had our first public one back at the University of Mount Olive this past year. We moved to the University of Mount Olive because it's much nicer, more space, safer, all that kind of stuff. We were just getting too crowded at, um, at the corner of Cucumber and Vine. But uh, we have thousands come, and one other story about that is that um, the first year that we actually opened it to the public, in 2001, Bill Bryan, my boss, was at in Atlanta at the Peach Bowl. And he's sitting in a bar and up on the TV screen on CNN, they're interviewing Ray Joyner, our maintenance superintendent, about the pickle drop. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think Bill had really paid much attention to what we were doing. Anyway. And um, 
but it was years before he ever missed another pickle drop. <laughs> So this takes us to the last 20 years. We've all lived through them, right? So um, you might be getting tired of listening to me. So I'm just going to do a few highlights here. You remember that um, the University of Mount Olive rose to national prominence in 2008 when the Trojans won the NCAA D2 National Baseball Championship. And that was so much fun. Carl um, Lancaster, of course, was the coach. We had a good time with that when they came home. Kids World at Westbrook Park. Now the land for Westbrook Park had been given to the town by Frances Westbrook, who was the wife of James Westbrook. Um, she um, back in uh, 1937, and then the town named the park for Frances Westbrook in 1976. But by the late 1990s, we knew the park needed something more. We just didn't know what. So world traveler Julie Beck spends a summer in Alaska, and she runs across a community-built playground. And so when she got back home, we began making plans, Patty, for um, to do the exact same thing at Westbrook Park with letters. We worked with Leathers and Associates of New York, and they helped us through the process. And it was really the coolest saying I've ever, been, I've ever been a part of. The community raised $130,000. Local children, school children, had gave input for the design for the things that they wanted in the playroom. A first grader from Parker Elementary submitted the winning name, Kids World, where people of all colors and walks of life could come and play. And 1,300 volunteers. Whew, built that playground from the ground up in five days. The funniest thing about that, well, there's lots of funny things, but um, we were going to do a countdown and let the kids all come run in, you know. Well, <clears throat> as y'all can tell, I kind of talk. And instead of just saying, I said, I said the word okay, <laughs> meaning okay, we're getting ready to do the countdown. <laughs> Well, all it took was okay, <laughs> and the uh, uh, floodgates opened, and kids were everywhere. <laughs> I've always loved that movie. <laughs> all right, so here's our Super Bowl champ. Greg Warren um, graduated from Southern Wayne in 2000. He is the son of Southern Wayne, of, of Southern Wayne head football coach Bob Warren at the time. Um, when he went off to college, he walked on to UNC Chapel Hill's Carolina's football team as a long snapper. He actually played all 40 years in 49 consecutive games. And his senior year, he was team captain, and they finally put him on scholarship. <laughs> After he graduated, he was drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2005. And the Steelers, the next year, went to the Super Bowl. He played in both the 2006 and 2009 Super Bowl games, and he came home with two Super Bowl games. He retired after 12 seasons with the Steelers in 2017, and he came back to this area, which I think is cool. You know, I gotta tell people this. <laughs> so in the, in the uh, 2015, 2016, Mount Olive, for the first time, rose to the top of the food trade in branded retail sales in the country. At the end of that fiscal year in April 2016, the company had produced a record 150 million jars of pickles. Man, we thought that was a lot. Today, uh, we dominate the pickle, pepper, and relish category, um, food trade, and multi outlet So it includes all the grocery stores, but also includes the places like Walmart's and Costco's and Sam's. When you put all that together, we have just over 30% of the U.S. retail pickle sales, which is astounding. And we are packing well over 200 million jars of pickles. And that doesn't include what we might want to pack when we move. We open a new operating um, facility in Goldsboro next year. So, 
this is a, a nod to Keenan because he wanted me to get the um, a toast to Mount Island in and the um, George Melvin Carr quote. Man, I thought this kind of worked out pretty okay. Um, I think it would be a good way to end tonight, this toast. And it was written by Elizabeth McGee Brazil. Name sounds familiar, right? Brazil Avenue. She was the wife of Matthew T. Peake Brazil, for whom Brazil Avenue is named. If you want to know, the street used to be known as Pearl Street, and it became Brazil Avenue. I think it's a much improved name. If you remember, Peak Brazil in 1901 was the first employee of the Bank of Mount Island, what is now Southern Bank. He um, helped organize the Mount Island Fire Department in 1904, and he was its first chief, and he served for a time as mayor. His wife, obviously, was the writer. And see, it's about time to be wrapping up. All the <laughs> so here's the toast. Here's to a spot in Dixie where the sun shines far more bright, where the trees are always greener and the cotton blows more white, where the strawberries grow more luscious in the early morning dew, and the songbirds sing more sweetly, and the flowers are sweeter too, where the hours you spend are golden, where the hearts are golden too. Here's to old Mount Olive. I love it best, don't you? <laughs>